The Cawthron Institute is selectively breeding mussels using the same methods that land-based farming has used for hundreds of years. At the moment, almost all mussel spat comes from the wild. It's mostly collected from 90 Mile Beach, where it washes ashore with seaweed. This is the first mussel breeding program in the world, so we've been able to borrow or implement some of the methods that are used for breeding other shellfish, so some of the methods for Pacific oysters, for instance. But basically, a lot of what we're doing is starting from scratch, so learning how to actually do the logistics of mussel breeding, and then looking to see um, what the potential is for genetic gain in the species. So we've started selecting for growth rate. And with these shellfish species, because you're selecting from the wild, you can get gains of, of 10 to 20 per cent per generation, at least in the first few generations. So there's a lot of gain to be made there. To be able to operate a breeding program, you need a hatchery. So a hatchery is just where you produce your seed stock. Having the hatchery gives benefits over wild spat. So first of all, you've got that kind of control of the process, and then you add on to that the genetic benefit. And we would expect to see improvements in production yield, production efficiency, and then the value of the product that you're able to produce, and the product quality. The work that we do at Cawthron, we, we consider it really important that it has this a link to industry, um, because you can't actually see how it's working until people start trying to use it. This is what we call our gourmet algae. Shellfish, for the first two or three weeks of their life, are a swimming organism. They're not attached to anything, they actually swim. And they feed on microalgae. So in here we've probably got quite a few million cells of microalgae, and this is basically the food that we grow for the shellfish for their first weeks of their lives. So what you're seeing here is the difference in maybe one or two days' growth as the algae multiply in the flask. These are two-week-old mussel larvae. It's a very delicate phase. You can see some of them swimming around here. And they're just swimming through the water, filtering the algae that we looked at before. Here's one about to start swimming. They have this swimming organ called a velum that they use to move themselves through the water and to generate the feeding currents that help sweep food into their mouth. So one of the things that's really neat about these larvae is that we'll do a fertilisation and the next day you've got a little shellfish like this which has got its two shells and it's, it's almost a miniature version of a, an adult shellfish. One of the other things that you have to learn with these shellfish larvae is how to judge their health. You can't relate to them like you might with a, you know, a farm animal or something like that. So we look at things like the, the, the colour of the, the gut as an indication of how much food they've been eating. We can even see the fat globules or lipids that they have, so we can tell their kind of level of condition. This is larval rearing, which is probably the most critical part of the logistics of operating a shellfish breeding program. The approach that we're taking to breeding here is it's called a family approach, where we're making selections within and between families of shellfish. And when we talk about a family, um, one family is the offspring of a single male and a single female. We can make quite accurate measurements of family performance, select the best performing families, and then also select the best performing individuals within those families. Once those muscle larvae have kind of gone through the transition to adulthood, they're no longer swimming, they're now a spat. So they attach themselves to a surface, they're much hardier, so they can live in a, a much rougher environment. So over here in the nursery, the water quality is not as good as it is in the hatchery, the food isn't as important. They're a much hardier individual. We grow them to a size where they're big enough to put some kind of identification marking on them. And that will be visible until the mussel grows to harvest size. And then we can go back and see which family um, each mussel has come from. So these mussels that we've got here at the moment have been in the nursery for about nine months. So what we try and do is get them through this juvenile phase as, as quickly as we can, and then we want to mix them together 
so that the mussels from the different families are all growing in the same environment so that one family isn't um, in, a, in a, an environment that's going to benefit it for any reason. You know, we want to see the genetic differences. Well, it's interesting that shell colour wasn't really one of the first things that people were interested in, even though it's quite easy to deliver from a breeding programme, but now there's, there's more and more interest in selecting for different colours, you know, as, as companies are thinking about marketing opportunities. And I guess it's marketed as the green shell mussel. So, for instance, if you can breed a mussel that has a really distinctive green shell, that really positions it in the market. Well, in terms of the breeding program, this is kind of like the end result. These are our stud mussels. For instance, the, the, here are three mussels from one of our um, best families. Um, we know it's a good family because all of the brothers and sisters in this family grew well and then we've produced offspring using some of the mussels from this family and they've performed better than average as well. So this is, this is kind of the end result and, and I guess at this point we would hand these over to industry and then they would use these to produce their spat that they're going to grow out to harvest on their mussel farms. <coughs> This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.